the best late night conservative talk show in America, Black Kids Radio. And listen, there are no people better on the air to give you the best in conservative talk than Sackhead Sean and Sackhead Clint. Uh, and uh, we're working on the immigration papers for a certain other guy who happens to work here, too. What? <laughs> those who are tuning in around the world to the best and late night conservative talk, Tacheas Radio. Welcome to another special edition of the Sackheads Radio Show. I'm your host, Sackhead Clint. We're here live from Freedom Fest 2015, Las Vegas, Nevada. Here with a very special guest, Mr. Bob Bowden uh, from Choice Media. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, Mr. Bowden, uh, I'd like to speak with you today about uh, your project, your, your Choice Media um, site, some of the things you folks are working on, some of the articles you've written. Sure. W- what is a sackhead? Um, so a sackhead, it, well, it depends. If you look at Urban Dictionary, it means something completely different than what we mean it. Okay. Um, and I don't know if that's meant to be an insult right now, so I don't know if I should be offended by that. Because you called me sweetness or something earlier. No, I did not call you <laughs> sweetness. I'm I've been sure, misquoted completely I'm pretty, already. I'm pretty sure it was We're, something to the effect of, hey, sweetness. And no. <laughs> I don't know. Exactly. I would like you to produce evidence of this. I, 30 I have seconds no into evidence. this program now, I've been horribly misquoted. <laughs> I have no evidence whatsoever All right. to support this All right. position. No, I was... Re- I was <laughs> borrowing your laptop for a second, and I said that your key, uh, your your mouse trackpad was sensitive. Uh, I was saying, wow, you know how some of them you move a, your finger a little bit and makes right. the mouse move a lot. Right. That's what I was saying. The mouse pad. So you called was me sensitive. sensitive. So yeah. I was sens- My mouse pad was sensitive. You, look, your mouse pad was, and maybe you are too. And, and maybe you I can am. embrace your masculinity by admitting something. <laughs> yeah, if I'm making a big deal of this, I'm obviously <laughs> sensitive. I'm right. making your point here okay. for you, all right? right? So I'm, we're all in agreement. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so a sackhead. So the way we started this. Now you're interviewing me on this show. So I'm, I'm sorry. seeing what you're doing here. Sorry. No, no um, I'll, please. I'll do whatever. We, we, we started this as a uh, as kind of like a an underground kind of. We wanted to remain anonymous at first. You know, about five years ago or four years ago when we first started this. So a sackhead was like a paper bag. If you look at our logo, paper bag a, over your head. Right. Right. Like, like the a, old like, Rodney Dangerfield joke. Exactly. Okay. Kind of. Yeah. So it was. Uh, it was. Uh, we're a little bit off color those our listeners know that about us um but we wanted to remain kind of that underground pirate radio kind of anonymous thing which is why we have the cross microphones in the skull oh Almost okay like crossbones and skull with the paper bag so so that, this is anonymous underground secret clandestine not radio anymore. show not anymore oh, not okay. since the feds found out about us and shut us down a couple times oh okay because yeah, you gave my name so <laughs> I, I, I i'm not oh, being no, too my, clandestine no, my name's out there i you see my business card and everything else oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, out, I'm out there all right um, so what are you working on sir So Choice Media is a news group focused on education reform, school choice, uh, tenure reform, teacher evaluation, online learning, homeschooling, uh, education savings account, vouchers, charter schools, this whole world which is radically transforming before our eyes. And there's, in our opinion, it's the least covered subject in the American media, at least covered well. There are a lot of sensational kinds of stories that get a lot of coverage, like school shootings and stuff like that. Right. But the but the system story of, of how this world is changing is uh, – it's it's – at least 50 different stories in 50 different states because different states are immensely different places in, in this regard. Uh, but there's also federal uh, issues, as I'm sure you know, like Race to the Top and Common Core. And other, there, there are and there are stories about certain cities and stories about certain technologies. So there is so much news flow in this that we decided someone needs to specialize the way Bloomberg specializes in finance or ESPN specializes in sports. Someone needs to take on this huge part of of not just the American economy, but American life, and, and and try to aggregate stories and create coverage about it, and that's what we do. And and this is specific education news, uh, that's specific right. to the education. And and here's why I think this is so important. And we've talked about it. So we've had several millennials on the show while we're here. Several of the, of the millennials have have uh, written books. Our target audience, actually, just because of the way we're completely ridiculous and obnoxious at times. Yes. Um, obviously, you got that just from sitting here with us. <laughs> um, we, we, is that. Uh, age 18 to, to 35, 40 uh, oh, okay. gap. That, that's really who our target audience right. is. It's really that untapped um, kind of, they tend to have more libertarian social views, sure. conservative fiscal views. Um, uh, so I should be working in words like awesome more, like you, a lot. You should be. Words like yeah, that. Yeah. Nailed it is a good okay. one. So like, right. if you make a good point, you can say I nailed it and you and I could high five. They seem to really like that. <laughs> uh, but but this, is, this has actually been a theme of ours during this show is, is education and the education system and how it really has um, not prepared our students well for 
anything in terms of oh, providing a, a found a good solid foundation understanding about our history or our values as a, as a, as a country or or the founding of our nature the principles and ideals or why we're great um, to the ideas where you have to go to a four-year university um, sure you know it's a bubble about to blow a, absolutely yeah. a, absolutely um, so I'm excited to, to have you on and I have a question for you what does the federal Department of Education do what have they how many students have they educated <laughs> Uh, zero. Okay, we can start with that. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think that was a rhetorical question or something. Uh, uh, no, you're no, leading that was the a witness specific question. That was a yeah. good, yeah. I mean, look, so, so there are some things the federal government has done, which uh, I guess improvements on what they used to do, I guess, but that's a low bar. Uh, you know, some would say that the federal government... Uh, you know, gee, uh, has some sort of role. If you're going to give, if you're going to hand money to states, so it's Title I money, for example, is federal money to help low-income kids because there are states who say that if we're Mississippi or Alabama or we don't have enough uh, uh, money, we we need this federal money to, because low-income kids are tend to be harder to educate because of social reasons. And so, anyway, if the federal government's going to give out this money, then someone should be looking to see how well it's spent. And there have been places where the federal government has found uh, corruption or poorly spent federal funds, and they've then gone in and told the states, "No, don't do this," or the districts, "Don't don't spend the money in this terrible way." I mean, the bottom line is, I- I'm with you guys. Get rid of the whole thing. You don't need right. it. And and, and the it's federal real. Department of Education is that? Yeah, it's it's you know it was it was um, uh, gee one of those departments that people often talk about eliminating, and yet when they get elected president, they never do. Right? Never never do. And look. Uh, First of all, why are we pouring federal money into local schools? I believe it's a, it's a local issue. Um, it's a ten, you, Tenth Amendment violation. Absolutely, absolutely. Do, do you discuss? Um, and I want to delve more into 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 this, but you know, religion in, in the schools is a is a big deal right now. Um, I know that there are schools in California, uh, which is where we're based out of, where if if a child they can have free reading time, but if a child brings a Bible into school. Right. Administrators lose their mind. Absolutely. Yet you look at one of the one of the four organic documents of our country, the, the Northwest Ordinance, which talks specifically about um, education, the importance of education and religion in order to maintain our our moral society. Um, and that's something that is overlooked, I think, um, in the court system. It's it's certainly not taught anywhere. I think very few people um, read about it or know about it. So. New Hampshire had a tax credit scholarship law that allowed uh, in, independent organizations, corporations could, in lieu of some of their taxes, give to this fund, which would be a scholarship fund. And so then the scholarship fund could give scholarships to kids to go to private school if, only if they wanted to, right? Mm-hmm. And it was means-tested, low-income kids, no, no rich kids got this money. And so, but a judge said, we'll let the program go forward if you give it, if you parent decides on a secular private school, but if the parent decides on a religious private school, that is a, sep- a violation of separation of church and state. It's a, it's a First Amendment violation. It's a s- establishing a religion, essentially, the Establishment Clause in the First Amendment. The judge said, no, you can pick any secular school on the list. It's fine. But as soon as they are either Catholic or Protestant or Jewish or something else, that's over the line. You, you know, you're not allowed to make that choice. Meanwhile, Pell Grants go to College kids who attend Notre Dame and Seton Hall and, you know, Holy Cross and, and religious colleges all over the country. Right. And everyone seems to think that's fine because it's just kind of grandfathered in. So, and, and that's uh, that nowhere, I, and I can't find it. And perhaps, I, look, I'm not a constitutional scholar, so it could be that I'm ignorant. Where in the Constitution specifically does it say there's a separation of church and state? Oh, it does not I anywhere in the Constitution. It, no, no it is no. It, it. Yeah, p- please yeah. P- put put that in your next Facebook comment. Th- I've done that before. I've, uh, like, by the way, just so you know, separation of church and state that phrase does not appear and never has appeared anywhere in the Constitution. It was in a letter that Jefferson wrote. That's right. To somebody. That's right. Somewhere. That's right. A church in Connecticut. Yeah, and completely yeah. taken out of context for today, and yet is quoted by our judges and and. Indeed. Well, they, they, they now say, oh, it's case law. It's 200 years of case law, and so therefore you must treat it as if it were in the Constitution. Right. Well, you know, gee, I mean, uh, it's, in my opinion, um, the First Amendment is pretty clear. That the government can't establish a religion, like the Anglican right. Church, what, which England had established, you know. Well, the federal so, government can't establish it. The states actually could. I mean, Pennsylvania had an official religion um, at, at the founding of our country. I mean, so... 
we're, t- we're talking about a federal thing here that people have just really kind of morphed. The and, whole and point of the idea yeah. that using your using your little tuition tax credit at a Catholic school across right. the street is any kind of government establishing a religion is preposterous. It's absolutely. Just preposterous. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. What do you think is the number one um, issue facing um, uh, American education today? Well, the push for school choice in its many different forms continues across the country. The most exciting development has happened where we're sitting right now, which is the state of Nevada. A few weeks ago, I don't know, four to six weeks ago, the governor signed uh, an education savings account law. It was the fifth state in the country to do this, and it is a, people are calling it vouchers 2.0. It's really a, it's, it's a radical change that's there's really nothing like it anywhere in the country. So instead, a voucher is like a coupon. You could take it from, if you leave, leave the public school, you can take it to a private school, but the government has set the tuition value of mm-hmm. that voucher. There's some bureaucrat decided, all right, we've decided the amount should be, you know, $2,926 because they're the expert on the setting of the price of, of education. Right. Uh, but still, it's great if for... If for uh, kids who uh, want to use vouchers to go to better private schools, and, and it, I'm not I'm not saying those programs shouldn't exist. Or th- they should grow. If people like them, they should grow. But the point is, education savings account is an amount of money that goes into an account, and that parents have a debit card. Literally, they hold a piece of plastic that can only be used for education expenses, and only a few certain education expenses. But they can char- They can go to a private school and give a, a, a tuition payment to a private school through that. Education savings account, debit card. They can buy Hooked on Phonics, or they can buy uh, Rosetta Stone, or they can pay for certain online learning courses. If they don't use all the money up in, mm-hmm. in that one year, it's saved in a college fund for later. So homeschoolers, anyone in the state of Nevada, can basically completely opt out of the public schools and have $5,100 that's given to them in a debit card, which they can use for online learning options to help homeschoolers, to give to a private school, to hire tutors. You would have this money to spend as you saw fit, and that is, it's not means-tested, it's everyone in the state. It's not just special needs, which was the original Arizona law. It's not just um, low-income kids. It's everyone in the state can opt out of the public schools. And is there a cost savings? I I guess if if a parent is getting $5,100 per student, what is the cost... Uh, for for a school year, say, what is the what does it cost the state to send a, a child through the public school system? Is it greater than fifty one hundred dollars? It is. This is the amount of money that was the state contribution, or maybe you know ninety something percent of the state contribution that would have gone to the local school. So the local school district does not have to pay any part of this education savings account amount. This was the state funding that's following the kid to some other educational option picked by parents. So it's not an additional tax or an increase in budget no spending additional or tax anything at like all. that because it's just tra- the money's being transferred from the school to the parent. It, instead of going to the school, it goes to the family. Exactly. So it doesn't cost the taxpayers one penny, and you have this explosion in school choice options. And, and that, that sounds like an amazing idea, and that's something I actually want to follow up on uh, because this is the first I've heard about it. Uh, it is there so millennials? We thought we talked already. We know that a lot of millennials actually listen to our to our show in our audience. Um, from an educational standpoint, because a lot of them feel like federal policies have really failed them, particularly with student debt and so forth. And I don't know if if a lot of them feel like they have to incur this debt because they have to go to a four year university and do oh. X, Y, or Z. How can they empower themselves? For, for, for their future through the education through the education system, what are some of the choices they can make? Because I think that um, from just some of them we've talked about, they feel like they really have no choice. They kind of have to go to college, they have to get this debt, and then there's no job for them. What choices can they make to empower themselves in order to make their future brighter from an educational standpoint? Yeah. So I, I agree with uh, some of the things some other scholars have said about this uh, subject, which is that if you're going to certain kinds of degree programs, it makes sense to go to college and incur the debt because you pretty much know you're going to get it back out. If you, if you get a degree in nursing, if you get a degree in engineering, if you get, if you go, certain, certain areas are are in high demand. So Mm -hmm. if you graduate from those programs, you're going to have a good chance uh, to go forward and college makes sense for them. Also, if you get accepted to an elite nationally known school, college makes sense to get for you. It doesn't matter. You can major in those schools, you could major in philosophy or something that doesn't have a big market demand afterward. But the fact that you've, give, you've been given that sort of imprimatur uh, throughout the rest of your life 
has great value. The, the problem is the kids that go to, uh, we'll call them average universities, and they go in programs for which there aren't jobs waiting afterward. All right, this to me is, this is where the bubble really is going to burst, and it's, it's going to be quickly. And so options for them, I mean, uh, there are websites like Coursera and EDX, which offer what's called MOOCs, M-O-O-C-S, Massive Online Open Courses. Okay, so these are free they are hundreds of courses delivered completely online by universities like MIT, Stanford, University of Chicago, uh, Harvard. Uh, the, really, all the great universities and some great state schools all over the country are offering free courses right now. If you Google Coursera, C-O-U-R-S-E-R-A, or EDX, those websites, you can peruse hundreds of courses. In fact, it's hard to look at that list of courses and not see something you want to take or I want to take. I've taken them. You have? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so I think this is this is the disruptive uh, force coming in higher education that's going to very soon blow the bubble up and, and, and break the doors wide open. Don't you? I, I, I really do. And but then how do we get people? How do we get people that credit? Um, they've they've taken these courses. They've done the work. They have the information. Um, so how do we get them the credit to to be able to use that? In a job market, is that something they can put on a resume where an employer, look, as an employer, that's something I would look at and say, hey, yeah, you may not have a degree, but I see that you have exercised personal initiative and you have enrolled yourself and completed these courses Absolutely. from these schools. Plus, you can, for pennies on the dollar, you can get you know, take tests and stuff to prove you have completed the courses and, uh, right. and you get certificates from those organizations. Uh, and so, and so, so how do we roll that into a degree? program and I understand well there are degree programs also there are completely online degree programs I mean you can get um, uh, you can get a master's in electrical engineering from Stanford purely online and never once go to I mean all kinds of MBA programs across the country you never go um, so there are are degrees also but are you paying for that degree from that particular school much less much less, but much you're still less. paying for that. You are. Yeah, so you would are. there be an, would there be because uh, schools are accredited by themselves, right? Like each school, they, they they there's no like federal accreditation. Oh no, there is. There is. Yeah, okay. there are there are university. You know, when universities lose their accreditation, it's very serious you, for them because I mean, quite frankly, it's it's not so hard to be accredited. <laughs> you know, there's right. some pretty lousy universities that are still have that are still fully accredited, right? right. So when you lose that, that's that's show that the extremely low <laughs> bar in the limbo contest you have or I think that would be, be a high bar. You could walk under It'd it. Be a high almost, bar in the limbo yeah. contest. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it show yeah, so yes, but so so technically yes, you can lose your accreditation, but it's uh it's it's not it's kind of uh it's pretty easy to keep it. I guess my question would be, would it be worth it to have a standard? Be it at the state level, the federal level, and maybe this is a job for Department of Education, right, where they have a, a standard where if you meet these, so let's say you take a history class from this university, all online, all with the free courses, and you take this course here or this course here, where you can send all of your, your paperwork in, your certificates in, and somebody somewhere could say, hey, you know what, you re- meet these guidelines and we are going to issue a or or say that you have a master's equivalent or a bachelor's equivalent or whatever like some agencies do for example i know there are some law enforcement agencies where you go through x amount of training or you take x number of classes and that agency can say hey you know what for our standards internally you have met the requirements where you have a bachelor equivalent you're sounding like a status to me with all this standard stuff no i'm, I'm kidding but it's, it's and, and I, i'm it, not but i'm wondering i want to find a cheaper way for people to get the education the signaling to say this absolutely. education is valid right. well i think the reputations of these schools matter and they build reputations over time and, it, and, and including uh you know university of phoenix where you can get online degrees i think their reputations are important and they and they that's what does it that what that uh, will, will there eventually be kind of a um you know, consumer reports of online degrees where you can look up a name of a school and see its rating because somebody has researched how, you know, do they really give difficult tests? Do they really, you know, measure whether the students learn? You know, oh, they do? Okay, we'll give them a rating of A+. plus. Sure, there could be a consumer reports like rating like that for online learning. Why not? Um, it's probably not enough people doing it yet for that to exist, but to me, that's the, op- that's the free market solution. Absolutely, and I, and I and I like that, and I'd also like to see something like I, again as a, as an employer, you know, I, I would give an education incentive for somebody who has completed X number of courses in this field or whatever it is, versus somebody that comes in 
without that. Yeah, uh, you, the employer is right. Employ- there, there can be ignorant, benighted employers who are unaware of the changes going on in society in any era. There can be, and there can be other, the other ones who are kind of more aware, like more open-minded, more, you know, even hiring people that in the past might have needed a college degree, but now nowadays people say, you know what, maybe this was a myth that everybody had to have some sort of a, you know, even if you had some kind of mediocre university degree with the C average, that would be so great compared to another candidate that right. you could tell was super smart and you could look at examples of their work, maybe an online portfolio, for example, right. and you would say, actually, I, this other guy without the degree seems way better. Like, I think more and more employers think like that. I do as an employer. Right. I've hired a guy who did not have a college degree and was fantastic, and I didn't care. And, and, and that's, I, I hope to see more of that. I, I think that, that that piece of paper is so important today to a lot of people, particularly to a lot of elites, um, it, where you know you don't know what you're talking about unless you have this piece of paper from this particular school. Sure. There are several instances where I would rather have somebody with a life experience um, or who has done a particular job um, for a particular length of time and really understands um, from a practical standpoint how things work, not from a um, you know controlled environment. Uh, Especially if they're mid-career professionals who decades ago had some sort of poli-sci yeah. degree from some sort of college you never heard of. You're going to be like, wow, that's real. I've got to hire you now instead of this really smart guy who <laughs> doesn't have a college degree. Right. Like, it, It'd be a form of insanity, I right. think, to think that way. But uh, you're right. There are, there are th- people that do think that way. Well, and, and that's unfortunate. Uh, Mr. Bowden, I want to thank you so much for being with us today, sir. Uh, we do have to get going. Where can our folks find uh, find your website if you can give that? Uh, sure. So please. the website is choicemedia.tv, as in television. The Twitter uh, education news feed, our Twitter handle is at choicemedia.tv. And when people start getting a sense of this news, news flow in the sort of education, it's like addictive. I mean, the brand new teacher evaluation in New Jersey, for example, this just happened a couple of weeks ago. The number was out. Uh, Chris Christie early in his uh, gov- first term passed this, you know, rigorous reform of, of, you know, tenure reform and teacher evaluation. And they now several years later, they have the results on the percent teachers ruled ineffective by the new system. It's 0.2%. This is the reformed teacher evaluation system. Considers 99.8% of teachers effective in the classroom. It's a kabuki theater game. And so... The whole point is I get really worked up about all this stuff. And if people are, are you know, follow us at Choice Media TV on Twitter, you'll see some of these stories. It'll, it'll amaze you. And here's why I think this is so important, particularly with a lot of the education debate that's happening um, in, throughout the United States. Parents are frustrated right now. Um, and there is there has not been, that I am aware of, um, a kind of almost, I don't want to call it necessarily a clearinghouse, but a location where you can go to one place and get a ton of different news and, and updated events and opinion pieces written about education here and um, almost almost like a resource uh, kit for parents that want to get educated. More and more parents are becoming to get involved, and I know this is off topic, but we had you know, there was just a huge uh, parental choice uh, debate really in California where this uh, mandatory vaccination was rammed down everybody's throat. Sure. Um, and so parents are, fr- and they're really talking more and more about pulling their kids out of the public school system and really being more engaged. So I think your site's very, very important and very timely. And let me leave you with this huge story that's just happened a couple of weeks ago. Rebecca Friedrichs uh, is, a, uh, is a plaintiff who sued because she wanted to quit the teachers union, right? Mm-hmm. She is a public school teacher, fourth grade teacher in Anaheim, California. And uh, the U.S. Supreme Court just announced they're going to hear her case. There are huge, there are some right to work states where teachers can already quit the union, but huge states, California, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Illinois, huge states where it is compulsory to pay union dues, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with them or not, you've got to pay these overlords called the teachers union. In one Supreme Court decision overnight, this could cut off billions, literally billions of dollars that are going to these unions uh, because they would say teachers have the right to walk away. Right. Or it could go the other way, too. Well, the other way would be the status quo. If she lost in her case, unless it would, these right to work, but that would that would then overturn those right to work states where those teachers would now have to pay into those those unions. Oh, I don't think they right. do that. I do not think that's what. No, I don't think that's a possible uh, outcome. outcome. Okay. Yeah, it's it's either they'll dismiss the whole th- they'll dismiss the wrong term, but they'll either rule if they rule against her, it'll be status quo. Okay. But uh, I mean, in, in Wisconsin alone, where Scott Walker passed, passed this, teachers could walk away, and overnight, a hundred. Uh, 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 
over 100,000 teachers opted to quit the union, right? So, so that was basically they were all paying $1,000 a month in dues, roughly rounding off. Right. So that's $100 million going into the teachers union every year in Wisconsin. Over a 10-year period, it's a billion dollars going into the teachers union that is now not going to go into the teachers union because teachers could quit, could quit in Wisconsin. That's one state. $100 million a year to teachers' unions, and all the what they do with campaign contributions have a huge effect on elections, national, state elections, all over the place, municipal, certainly school board elections, too. And this could disappear overnight. Well, certainly one to watch. Sir, I really appreciate you being here again. That's Mr. Bob Bowden. Again, check out the website. It's Choice Media. Um, excellent website. For the Sackheads Radio Show, I am Sackhead Clint. Live Freedom Fest 2015. Socko, play us out. The best late night conservative talk show in America that is radio and listen there are no people better on the air to give you the best in conservative talk than Sackhead Sean and Sackhead Clan uh, and uh, we're working on immigration papers for a certain other guy who happens to work here too <laughs> for those who are tuning in around the world to the best in late night conservative talk the best late night conservative talk show in America. In America. In America. And in this web was a large, I'm pretty sure it was the biggest spider I've ever seen.